because I hadn't been able to see my grandchildren. I can't wait to get back to field trips with my school. Not having to think about putting on a mask. I really can't wait to get back to life, really. I miss all my friends. I miss taking pictures in school. An expression on someone's face when you do something nice for them. COVID-19 vaccines are available, and they're the first step to safely getting back to things we miss most. Visit GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision about COVID-19 vaccines. COVID-19 has changed how we spend weekends with the girls. Now it's time to take the first step that lets us get back to brunching instead of late night munching. Before we can safely come together, we need the facts. As COVID-19 vaccines become available, you may have questions. Should I get it? Is it safe? Should I wait? It's okay to have questions. Now get the facts at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Good morning. My name is Kelly Richardson Lawson and I am founder and CEO of Joy Collective, which is a DC based firm right here in Washington DC, of course. I'm really delighted that you are all here with us today, especially given the fact that today marks the first committee hearing uh, for the insurrection. I know many people have shifted plans to watch that or um, many people are there. And so I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here today for this important conversation on COVID-19 vaccines, as well as a very intimate conversation with five families who are descendants of the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. So thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Today's event is part of the Ad Council's It's Up to You campaign, which is all about educating the black community on COVID-19 vaccines. And before we get started, I want to say a very special thank you to Dr. Wayne Frederick and your great team of professionals here at Howard University, which happens to be my alma mater. Uh, thank you so much for your tireless work over the past few days to help pull this event together. Really appreciate it. And especially with such uh, effective COVID protocols as you see. So we are three feet apart, every other row in the house and really appreciate all of you for keeping your masks on today as well. So thank you for all of that. I also wanna thank our partners at the Ad Council, Black Coalition Against COVID, COVID Collaborative and the many media outlets that are here today, including the Washington Post, WHUR, CBS, ESPN, The Undefeated, WHUT, um, WPFW, and Roland Martin Unfiltered, which is streaming this live on his social platform. So thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate it. Joy Collective, in partnership with the Ad Council, Black Coalition Against COVID, and COVID Collaborative, came together to produce this event and to produce a series of PSAs in an effort to help educate the black community about COVID-19 vaccines. And we, what we know is that research has shown that the Tuskegee study, as it's commonly called, was cited time and time again in the black community as one of the key reasons for hesitancy or skepticism about getting the vaccines. So what we have done is create a series of beautiful PSAs, some of which you'll see today and you saw earlier. And today's program is going to share those PSAs and highlight the stories of five families who are descendants of fathers, grandfathers, uncles, um, and more who were affected by this study. We will meet them shortly. To get us started, I would first like to welcome Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt, who is the DC Health Commissioner. She brings remarks from the DC Mayor's Office. Dr. Nesbitt? Good morning. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, it, is it is a tremendous honor to be here uh, this morning with all of you uh, on behalf of Mayor Bowser and the residents of Washington, D.C. We have been extreme beneficiaries of the work of all of these partners that are here today. Uh, you know, in the District of Columbia, we have worked hard from the beginning uh, in terms of addressing disparities in COVID-19 related outcomes and working to ensure that everyone had access uh, to vaccines. And a, a couple weeks ago, I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues and really having the opportunity now to be more introspective. Um, I said to her, I said, you know, when we started medical school and we started training, uh, we inherited a lot of health disparities. 
And one of the things that has been extremely disheartening for us is that we could have prevented disparities in COVID-19 outcomes if we had made a more equitable society and had done a much better job of building trust back in our communities of color, and particularly among our black residents. You know, we have a long way to go. We've accomplished many things. Uh, we believe that the uh, discussions that will be had here and the resulting PSAs will help us uh, advance our mission and cause even further uh, to get more black folks vaccinated. Uh, it, as I look at the data, I can clearly see how getting people vaccinated helps to eliminate some of those disparities. When I look at my population over 65, there's not a big gap or not really much of a gap between blacks and whites who have been vaccinated here in D.C. When I look at my younger folks from 12 to 17, uh, my younger age groups, there's a threefold difference in the number of black kids who are getting COVID now uh, than their white counterparts. And that's a function, a, hu a huge function of there being a greater gap in vaccination rates between black and white youth. Uh, so we have to do a, a much better job of getting people to understand why this is protective for them, uh, for their family, and for our community as a whole, and how we can have the chance to eradicate one of the disparities and inequities in health that has been plaguing us over the last 18 months. So again, I'm tremendously honored to be here. I look forward to learning so much from the esteemed guests and panelists here, and I thank all of the partners uh, who have been part of, including Washington, D.C., and helping to improve COVID-related outcomes against our black folks in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you so much. Um, next, I want to introduce Sherry Thompson, who was one of the main reasons we are here. Sherry Thompson called us at Joy Collective in January and said, I have a project I really would love to work with you on. We've done work together many years, actually, in prior lives. And Sherry Thompson is leading all of the work on COVID-19 vaccines for the Ad Council in terms of its education initiative. Please welcome Sherry Thompson. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Ad Council, our CEO, Lisa Sherman, and the COVID Collaborative, we welcome you to today's event. Through our It's Up To You campaign, our largest national campaign in our history, we have been committed to driving awareness as well as education around COVID-19 vaccines to all communities, including the black community. We've been committed to driving and increasing vaccine confidence, especially in communities of color, which we all know have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. To Kelly's point, at the foundation of all of the work that we've done is research. And the research that we've done in the black community, time and time and time again, the item that consistently gets risen, risen is the Tuskegee study. So we knew we really needed to get underneath it to really understand the tragedy that happened to those black men, to best understand their story so that we really could use it to inspire us and to empower us. So I tell you, it's been a pleasure and it's been an honor to work with Kelly and her amazing team at Joy Collective, to work with the best director ever, Deborah Riley Draper, and one of the most amazing organizations, the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, led by Dr. Reed Tuxen, and the amazing descendants, which you will get a chance to know today. So today, we hope that you will be inspired. Today, we hope that you will be empowered. And we hope that you will help us to share these amazing, amazing, life-changing stories. And you can do that by going to getvaccineanswers.org slash legacy. And without further ado, it is also my pleasure to introduce to you Anita Nixon, who is the CEO of Howard University Hospital. And as we talk about history, we're gonna talk a lot about history today, no greater history than the hospital. Over 145 years of serving our community. 
and our CEO was appointed in February of last year. She's a bad sister, over 20 years of experience in the healthcare industry. So with that, I announce Anita. Thank you, enjoy today. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure it is to join you today. My name is Anita Jenkins, and I'm the CEO of Howard University Hospital. And it has been my pleasure to be a part of that hospital's journey toward excellence in healthcare and the community that we serve. Thank you to Dr. Frederick, Howard University, Dr. Mighty, Dr. Tuxton, uh, Dr. Next Nesbitt, uh, DC Health, DCHA, members of the media, and invited guests in attendance today to help increase vaccine awareness and confidence in the communities where we live and serve. Thank you very much, Joy Collective, for inviting me to be a part of this event. And lastly, I really give honor to the descendants of the Tuskegee study for their bravery and sharing their tragic story so we may be motivated to help unvaccinated populations and help save lives. Coming to Howard University Hospital was an interesting journey. I started February 17th, 2020, just a couple of weeks before the COVID-19 was declared a worldwide pandemic. We started working, we started seeing, we started changing the hospital. We worked with Dr. Nesbitt and DC Health. We worked with the mayor to make sure that we could expand and make room for the people that we are serving, for those COVID victims that were getting so sick and dying. We looked and we worked and one day, our chief medical officer walked in my office and she said, black people are dying more. I said, what? What are you, what are you talking about? And then it became very, very clear that we had a healthcare disparity problem, that we were starting to get sick and, get to, and to die more. And so that fight added to the battle in which we were trying to make sure that we were saving all kinds of lives, but especially the lives of the black and brown. In the fall of uh, 2020, it was so exciting to finally hear that a vaccine might be on its way. I recall so clearly that I was on a Zoom call with all of my leadership, 120 leaders, directors, managers, in the clinical realm, nurses, doctors, leaders. And I said, a vaccine is coming. And I said, if we have the opportunity to have a vaccine site, we will take that on. We will get that. We will start spreading the word about the vaccine. And in the Zoom call, I recall very clearly, but what about Tuskegee? But what about Tuskegee? I mean, it just popped up in the chat room. You know how that works. And I thought, oh, oh whoa, 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 not the same thing. Even on that call, I said, this is a worldwide pandemic with a worldwide solution. This is not another American scourge against black and brown people like uh, the, vac the vaccine, I'm, I'm sorry, like the Tuskegee trials were. It's not that. We are here for something different. We are here for something more. And today, I want you to know that it has been an honor to be a part of vaccine clinics, to be a part with the university and the hospital. As I walked out the hospital today, our vaccine clinic is still going strong at the hospital. And I could tell that these were community members and employees but we're not there yet. We've still got some work to do. Do you know why I'm so passionate about this group today? Our youngest, our 25-year-old police officer's son in Ohio, out of the five children that we have, he is not vaccinated. He's not sure. He's been told things. Nobody else in his group's had it. We've got to fight for this. We've got to fight for the lives of our families and our children, our community, our neighbors. If we haven't fought before, now is the time. What will help us fight? Knowledge, information, and clarity of facts. So I'm excited to be here. I am honored to be here. So in closing, thank you very, very much for allowing Howard University Hospital and Howard. I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this historic endeavor. If we are able to encourage just one person to get vaccinated who was hesitant or was in denial about vaccines, we could save a whole household or even a whole community from getting sick and even dying. I thank you for your participation and thank you for being here.
Thank you for that. So why are we here today? We're here because of these stories from these incredible families. And how we got here is because we saw an article in the Washington Post written by a gentleman named David Montgomery, who I believe is here with us. And we read this article that featured several of the families um, from the study and had a conversation with the Ad Council and with Black Coalition Against COVID and decided to create some beautiful stories, really sharing their stories to transition, to show the transition from tragedy to triumph. And we wanted to bring these stories to life and show the human side of these men that were treated so um, violently and poorly. And so we wanted to bring together an incredible storyteller, someone who could really bring and honor, bring to life their stories and honor their lives beautifully. One person came to mind. Her name was, is Deborah Riley Draper. And Deborah is a very well-known and critically acclaimed filmmaker. She just, um, just directed the two episode docu-series, The Legacy of Black Wall Street on OWN. She has also directed Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, and she has done a tremendous amount of work in the film space. More importantly, she's a dear friend now, and she is here to share with you the stories of tra tragedy to triumph. Please welcome Deborah Riley Draper. Good afternoon. It is such a pleasure to be here. It's an honor, in fact. Um, as a storyteller, being able to bring our history into a story, being able to bring our truth, being able to bring our lived experience is exactly what we like to do as filmmakers, as storytellers, as content creators. When the Ad Council and Joy Collective called me and they shared what the objective of the creative brief would be, I immediately raised my hand. I said, I'm in, I'm all in. I wanna be a part of this campaign. I wanna be a part of this storytelling. And what I didn't know was that this particular experience would change me for the better. This experience helped me understand what our cultural inheritance is as African Americans. And it's our stories, our good stories, our great stories, our not so great stories, but it's us telling our stories, being at the forefront of changing our narrative, being at the forefront of making sure that we have the facts, of making sure that we understand what happened to us, making sure that we're in the forefront of changing what can happen to us in the future. So I cannot tell you how proud I am to stand here um, having met descendants of the United States Public Health Services Syphilis Study at Tuskegee. And that's one of the things I learned, how to say the name correctly. And that's critically important um, as we tell the story. So I'm proud to have met the descendants. I'm proud to have met the people behind this idea because we need to band together in our storytelling, we need to band together in our communities. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce you to a mini documentary. We did five uh, pieces of content, four 60 second spots, and a mini doc that allows the descendants, which is how I like to work as a storyteller, to tell their story, to bear their truth, and to share their family's history with all of us. So ladies and gentlemen, the legacy. Thank you. Step in my shoes. I've had someone tell me that they were concerned about getting the COVID vaccine because of the syphilis study. They didn't even know my grandfather was a part of the study. Tuskegee is a very sacred place. There is no way you cannot feel history. Think about the Tuskegee Airmen and all of the greatness that they did. And then to find out that in this same space, such an atrocious study was being heaped upon our men. The study began in 1932. Segregation and Jim Crow were the structures of how our society functioned. What happened with the men and their families? It was the untreating of syphilis. The original title of the study is Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. They were not treated for a disease that killed them, that made them blind. My great-great-grandfather, John Good, he was of uh, the clergy, he was a farmer. He was a syphilitic in the study. 
and our family really didn't talk about it. Both of my great-grandfathers had been a part of that study. They were sharecroppers, and then later they were able to get land of their own. On my right here is Alec Ware, we call him Big Daddy. On my left here is Papa Frank Cooper, and he went blind at a young age. I am the daughter of one of the men in the study, Freddie Lee Tyson. I'm also the daughter of Johnny May Neal Tyson. I have to include my wonderful mother because the two of them was on the journey together. My uncle used to always run after us. We'll get your ear, I'm gonna get you. And we just run and run and run, and then we run right back to him. My grandfather and I were phenomenally close. He worked as a firefighter where the Tuskegee Airmen trained. Actually caught my first fish with my grandfather. My father had congenital syphilis from his mother. There were a number of opportunities for the men to receive treatment and they were very intentionally barred. And everyone involved in that study wanted it to go untreated until their death. Their body would then be sent to be autopsied to see the effect. Around 1947, penicillin became widely accepted and widely used. The doctors of the study prevented the men in the study from getting penicillin. The first thing those doctors should have done for these gentlemen was to make sure that each and every one was treated. It was the fall of 72. My brother Wallace read an article about the study. And a couple of days later, my father received a phone call indicating that he was in the study. When he found out what the study was really all about and that he had been used and treated as a guinea pig, there was just a lot of uh, shame In comparing um, what's happening today with COVID with what happened back in 32, I see more of a contrast than a similarity. A lot of misinformation is out there that is causing people to think twice or to hesitate. And one of them is the fact they think the men were injected with syphilis and they were not. I mean, they were not injected with the spirochete that causes syphilis. They were not being treated. That is very different from what's happening with COVID-19. The vaccine is being made available to anyone who wants it. Too many people are using the study as a way of causing their own selves to deny access to vaccines that would save their lives. And when we talk about COVID-19, for example, we're not talking about the non-treating of Blacks, we're talking about the treating of all people. The ways in which COVID-19 ravaged Black communities show that we have underlying vulnerabilities when something like a pandemic hits. That, to me, really connects uh, what's happening now with a very important historical legacy. As a result of what happened to these men, it changed the course of American clinical research. It created the Institutional Review Boards, which is a very important intervention that says that there must be people who can examine every study that is done on human beings in this country. Wherever there's, there's research that's happening, there has to be informed consent documents that are signed, not just when participating in clinical trials, but also if you're going to get any type of a medical procedure, those things came because of that study. It boils down to truly understanding the concept of community, which is two words, common unity. The path from tragedy to triumph travels along the path of learning. I've taken both of my vaccines, and you're talking about something that happened to my family. We can't do this by ourselves. In order for us to be healthy together, we need to all be vaccinated.
right, now for what we're all waiting for, to introduce our descendants. First, we have Mr. Leo Ware. Mr. Mayor Omar Neal is next. Mayor Omar Neal, he's the former mayor of Tuskegee. Dr. Kimberly Carr. Carmen Head Thornton. Lily Tyson Head. And our fantastic director, Deborah Riley Draper. Thank you. You guys all have a seat. I'm so excited to ask you guys questions. Do you know I've been asking you questions since the day I met you? So it, it, it will continue. Um, Miss Lily, who you know I've now actually adopted, um, do tell me when we called you and we said we wanted you to be able to explain your story. What came to mind, and what um, was the the both enthusiasm and also the initiative that made you say yes to being a part of this campaign? Thank you, Deborah. When I received the phone call. Uh, and you explained to me what you were going to do. I was elated that we had a that we had a platform and a voice to be able to tell our fathers a story, and at the same time be able to promote and to encourage our community to take uh, the vaccine. First, knowing the facts and getting informed. So I was very happy to be a part of uh, the conversation of taking the vaccine and so thankful for the opportunity to do this. Thank you. Dr. Carr, when we uh, met in Atlanta, one of the things you shared with me is that this was a story your family never spoke about. Talk to me about going from never actually talking about this story to putting your story in a public service campaign for the world to see. It was um, a very interesting experience um, because we didn't talk about it and we didn't know about it until I was going for um, graduate studies at Morehouse School of Medicine and they offered a bioethics scholarship. And it was a merit scholarship, so when you're a graduate student, you're looking for money and I remember telling my mom, I said, hey, weren't we a part of this? Because we, we, we talked about it a little bit, just as a sound bite. Oh, yeah, those folks down there, bad blood. That's what my mom said. And I was like, okay. And then I remember my aunt having it in her, um, her library. So we talked about it in that way, considering we're looking for money for graduate school. And then that's when we had that conversation around it. And it led us to Smith Stations, Alabama, where um, another descendant is also a board member, Clemens Jolts. He's also my cousin. So we sat down as a family and actually talked about it in depth. And now sitting here, my mom pulled out um, her uh, 1997, May 16th, 1997 um, poster. It was laminated um, at the, in the, the local newspaper. She laminated it. And she takes that with her and she takes it with me as well to say, get it back if you, um, if you leave it somewhere. So it's, it's magnanimous in the fact that we started from not knowing as much to knowing a lot now to where I'm sitting here discussing my great, great grandfather. Thank you. Uh, former Mayor Omar Neal, you born and raised in Tuskegee, educated in Tuskegee, you became the mayor of Tuskegee. Talk to me about the importance of being a part of this campaign personally as a descendant, but also as a person who loves the community. Thank you so very much, uh, Deborah. And let me also say uh, how incredible you are. I, I have to start out by saying that you are such an incredible person and did an incredible work uh, uh, with this project. Uh, being the mayor of Tuskegee uh, gives you an opportunity to present 
uh, your community in the most favorable light. And I, what I found was that uh, when people were talking about camp, uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, they were normally invoking uh, the name Tuskegee, and oftentimes out of context. And so this particular project gave us an opportunity to put the record straight, to set the record straight uh, in terms of uh, the study that was conducted in Tuskegee, not the Tuskegee study and uh, to make sure that people recognize that this was the United States public health study conducted in Tuskegee, but more importantly, to humanize the men who were a part of that study. Uh, these were fathers and brothers and uncles and cousins. They were community members who were carpenters and plumbers and brick masons and farmers. These were our patriots. These were our community people. And so the best thing that I thought we could do is to first honor them, to humanize them, and then to put in context what happened at Tuskegee. And so that's why I'm here today and honored to be here today. Thank you. Mr. Ware, you have a unique position in that not only were both your grandfathers a part of the study, you personally knew a lot of the men in the community who had been a part of the study. Can you tell us what, your ex what you remember of these men and why you wanted to be a part of telling their story? Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for having me. And I really have enjoyed myself this far. And if I told my story and went from my childhood and brought it up to a part of the day, you would probably be sitting here all night, so I'm going to kind of make it brief. <laughs> I grew up there in Alabama and on the farm and a lot of the relatives, close-knitted community, and you sometimes have to be careful when you're out cold and you have to ask mama if they didn't can. <laughs> so that's how close it was. And we got the, what they call sharecropping. We got to help each other gather their cropping and then they would help us gather our cropping. It wasn't a such thing as paying and shedding out money, they just share what they have with each other, and we share and we go on with life. And I came to Florida in 1956 and got established in Florida. And I was, in 1971, I uh, got into uh, my service station there in Orlando, uh, and my mother called me and she advised me that my uh, uh, grandfather was in the study and what went on. And then I, I flashed back when I was running around there with bare feet, no shoes, uh, pants had holes and patches in them, and as a little boy and one of, you know, uh, what they said, a uh, thing about bad blood. At that time, that was what they were telling me. And I learned from joining the organization after that, I got kind of educated on uh, what was going on and how it is existed, how it was brought about. And then I had a chance to go to the DCC Center in Atlanta and pull up the records of those men that was in this study. And I found out then that my grandfather, one of them was actually in the study but he didn't have the sifters. The other one was in the sifters, and then he was, uh, he had the sifters. And that was an education to me, and then I was able to pull up some of my relatives and some of my uncles and my cousin that was in it and realize what they went through and what their condition was. And that was part of my education because I was, oh, I was fired up. I was ready to kill somebody, shoot somebody, but after being educated and you learn why these things happen and why they were doing it, give you some knowledge 
that uh, you, sh you will have to take life and go on, and hope that these things won't happen again. And that was m some of my experience with uh, being involved. And I got involved here, and I asked myself, I wonder why. You know, I could be at home now relaxing, having a cup of coffee on the golf course somewhere. But then it's a safe thing, as God say, uh, public service is one of the greatest things you can do. So I owe my life, I've done public service. So I was in the service station, and I, uh, I waited on people. I served people, and I, I gave them credit when they didn't have no credit card. Hopefully they paid me, and some of them did, and some of them didn't. So that's another story. But anyway, being a public service, and I got into this, and I said, well, this is public service too, and, and it will help make things right or something good come out of a bad situation. So I got involved, and here I am at Harvard University sitting up here telling my story, and, and if you want to read some more about me, just go up on my Facebook there, and you'll see the pub, the Tuskegee pub, the sip, the study up there. You'll see where I'm taking my shot, first time, second time. And if that don't encourage somebody after reading my story to go down and get the shot to take care of your neighbors, your friends, and your relatives, or your kin folks, or somebody might contract it through you, then you need to go back and search your common sense, because sometimes that education better than that, that common sense come in to kick in. But when you got both of them, you're well educated. You got one without the other, you're in pretty bad shape. So I'm gonna let it go at that. And uh, I, like I said, it's been a pleasure being here. And I, this is another chapter of my life that I go down and I'll be able to tell my grandkids and tell them about it. And I got my kids now involved in this study also. So I appreciate you all listening to me. And, and I'm gonna close at that. And God bless America, God bless you. And y'all have a good time. Thank you, Mr. Ware. It's incredibly important that we spend time with our elders and the people in our community who have firsthand knowledge of what happened. Um, our, our history travels through oral history. Our history travels not as often through books, right? So we get to cherish the stories that you tell us, Mr. Ware, because they're critically important. They help us ground us in our past so that we actually can have a future. Um, thank you. So, Carmen, um, your grandfather was a part of this study. Talk to me about being both a health professional and a descendant and how this reconciles in your head when you're in meetings professionally and people reference the Tuskegee study professionally and this is a part of your life personally. Of course, and thank you so much, Deborah, for this wonderful opportunity, and thank you to Howard University, my alma mater. It's wonderful to be back home. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was listening to, uh, to Mr. Ware and thinking about this panel yesterday evening. I was thinking about a couple of stories myself because I do think oral stories or oral history um, really sort of helps people take things away from panels like this. Um, and so the first one I had was when I was younger, I used to comb my grandfather's hair Occasionally, I used to comb his hair, and um, we would be in the family room, and I would get up on his shoulders. We would be on the sofa, and I'd get up on his shoulders, or I would get, uh, we'd be in the living room, and there was a little nook uh, with a window and I'd, where he'd make his quilts, and I'd get up on his shoulders, and I would comb his hair. It was so relaxing to him, and I was sitting on his shoulders. And in essence, you know, I'm still sitting on my grandfather's shoulders. Um, I have dedicated my entire career um, to my grandfather and his um, involvement in this study. I've known about it my entire life. And so I feel that these vaccine ex efforts also um, can be aligned to, in a certain extent to standing on the, sh uh, the sitting on the shoulders um, of the men that were involved in this study. Um, we have, there's so many lessons that we are still learning from what happened in the syphilis study. There's still so many lessons there's still some research that needs to happen. Um, and it's just um, interesting. I was listening to, I think, the, the health commissioner talking about disparities and um, the shock um, that the president of Howard University's um, School of Medicine had when we learned that you know this was in, um, um, an illness that was impacting black and brown community, communities more. Um, and so let's travel 30 years upstream. 
um, to when the HIV AIDS epidemic was booming and how we learned it was a black and brown community issue. It's not about the illness. It's about who's marginalized and who's getting resources and who isn't. And so here I am um, post-grad, um, many years ago, I won't say what year, but um, still working, still working in, in, um, in the D.C. area doing national, national um, efforts in, in public health and in health promotion. Then one quick story about my grandmother. Um, uh, she died when she was 99, um, and we were having a very adult conversation, and she was saying, she told me, I'm going to tell you what life is about. And she said, life is about these three things, going through something traumatic, healing from that, healing from it, learning how to help somebody else because of the lessons that you took from that and making somebody else's life better. If you haven't done those three things, then you really don't know what life is about. And so as we walk through this exercise as family members, um, this is what we're doing. We've, we're healing, we're, we're looking to ways to, to partner with groups like you, with the coalition um, to address COVID in the African American community and other communities, but we're healing and we're reaching out and helping other people and lifting other people up. And that is so exciting. It's so exciting to be able to be at this venue um, to do that. Great, I have a, a, a couple of other quick questions. Um, you know, and this is totally about filmmaking because I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. So Ms. Lilly, what, tell the audience what you learned about filmmaking during this process because I'm sure they want to you know, know that as well. And then we'll flip it back to health. But what, what, what was your, your impression of being a part of a public service announcement campaign. You've seen the Ad Council for decades on television doing amazing work, and this time you are actually a part of an Ad Council campaign. You know, what was that like when all the cameras rolled up and showed up? <laughs> well, at first, at first I was, I guess I was too naive to know what to expect. And when uh, Deborah and her crew came with all of the cars and all of the cameras, I was just, I had gotten to the point where it was beyond anything that I could have imagined. And th the only thing I could do was to go with the flow and listen to what they were telling me to do. But it was an experience that I will never forget. And the only thing that saddens me about that was that all of the descendants were not a part of telling their stories. That was the satin part. I would also say that I always called the, the, the spirits of my ancestors, especially my mom and my dad, uh, into the space that I am in. And so I brought them into that space and I had a calm feeling about what I was doing and it helped me to realize the importance of what I was doing and the impact that it probably could happen. So I sit here today not for me but for all of the men who were in the study, and even beyond them, because this story is beyond them. As my cousin Omar has mentioned, it's about the humanity, the, the, the treatment of one human being to another. And it doesn't just stop with uh, one race treating another race uh, inhumanely. It stops with everyone treating another person inhumanely. So our story is not just about us or about the black community. It's about everyone, every human being on this earth. So I, I will never forget that. But I must say that Deborah, and I must call Lacey, so she could hear her name in this, 
uh, they were delightful. And Deborah and I and, and Lacey, it just seems as though we had a kindred spirit. And she said she has adopted me. But um, I also feel as though she is, is like a daughter. And I'm, I'm, I cherish that relationship and I appreciate her. And there's one other person I'd like to, or well, actually two others. Um, David Montgomery with the Washington Post, I think his article uh, inspired uh, Dr. Tuxon, uh, who I think is also here, uh, to um, reach out to the foundation and the descendants. So I appreciate that. But I want to leave just one thing, if I may, uh, with all of you, is that this is not just about all of the 623 men who were in the study, but this is about, to me, the human race. Thank you so much. Two more quick questions before we go, before, before they you know, come out here with a hook for me. So, um, Ma Mayor, exactly. Mayor, Mayor Omar, there's, we were talking about full circle. And one thing you shared with me took me by surprise. You were born in the hospital where many of the men in this study were treated. Can you tell me a little bit about full circle for you and being a part of this campaign from the day you were born to right now? quickly, but you know, you know exactly what I mean. You know, it's interesting. It was only uh, recently that I really thought about that, that during the time that the study was taking place was the same time I was born in the same hospital. And to think about maybe there were men being treated the same day that I was born. And so it, it, it brought me into the story in, in a way that was not historic, but, but personal. And, and although, you know, we talk about my uncle, Freddie Lee Tyson, uh, Lily's father and Carmen's grandfather, but we had other family members who were a part of that study. Uh, my great uncle, Rufus Neal and his son, Reuben Neal. And you know what? I don't think you can find a person who lived in Tuskegee that did not have a relative or somebody that they know that was a part of that study. So that study permeated the whole community. And so we were all a part of the study. And so that's why, you know, we, we used to sing a song uh, when we were in church a long time ago, it says, a charge to keep I have and a God to glorify and every dying soul to save, to fit him for the sky, to serve this present age, my calling to fulfill. May it all my power engage to do my master's will. And, and that's why we're here. It, it's to honor them by doing something that will serve mankind. That's why we're here. Dr. Carr, what would you feel your ancestors, along with the 600 plus men who participated, would say to you, knowing what work you are personally involved in? If you can share a little bit what you can with, with the audience, what your day will look like tomorrow, and how that ties back to your family's history. Um, if we keep going, so I, hopefully I don't break because um, before we walked out, I, I teared up. So tomorrow, um, I am the project lead um, on COVID-19 and flu vaccine hesitancy needs assessment, well, needs assessment in Georgia. And tomorrow, my team and I, we present preliminary findings to the, um, one of the health district directors in Georgia, and she oversees 13 counties. And the county that we're in has the highest percentage of blacks um, in the county. So as a researcher, hearing the key informant interviews that I conducted and also um, some of the focus groups, 
the study came about. And they are aware the study itself, in a nutshell, highlights the aspects of African American or the African American rural health experience. So to know that in my work, as we do this round table discussion tomorrow of these preliminary findings of, of what we've conducted, to know that that study is still being uplifted and discussed um, in these key informant interviews and racism, discrimination, mistrust of government, all of those things, it's very impactful, but at the same time, teaching my colleagues along the way, the historical and cultural context of the study, um, and that's something that I'm always at war with, um, and I had a very brief conversation with former Mayor um, Omar, is the empathy of it, especially for people who have not been directly impacted that does not look like me. And it's difficult sometimes leading a team that doesn't look like me, and they do not understand the importance. But I would say, and to answer your question in a nutshell again, is to keep going even when you're standing alone. Last words, Carmen. Um, what do you want the world, the audience, the people that hear all of you in this campaign and hear you on the stage, what do you want them to know? And what do you want them to do? I want them to encourage their communities and their families, if they haven't, to, haven't gotten their vaccine, to, to get the vaccine. And if there's hesitation, to learn as much as you can. I don't want anybody to be doing anything blindly, um, to be encouraged to be encouraged to take the vaccine and to, and to be uh, the best champion, the best advocate for your own health. Um, we have, um, you know, being a part of um, something so historic um, that has impacted so many layers of healthcare and research around the world, um, it's a little overwhelming sometimes. Um, this journey, um, since COVID um, began, um, it, it, you know, the, the, the media questions and the media response and reaction to us, it sort of ebbs and flows. Um, we've, you know, I know I've been vocal in, in doing um, different talks um, really since Clinton's, um, President Clinton's of apology. Um, and so um, this is the largest spike I think that we've seen. And um, when I talk to people um, in my work or you know, in leisure and in social settings, people are so shocked um, to to know someone who is a descendant, my grandfather, to know someone that was a um, a part of the study. There are hundreds of us. There are hundreds of family members, and we're not as removed or, or, or as distant as you think. Um, and I'm not sure who all of is represented here: medical students, or public health practitioners, or any other experts in the field. But we're it, it's it's. Um, what happened at the civil study, it's not in our too far distant past, and that his, history can repeat itself. Um, and we have to be vigilant um, in our work. We have to care for our communities, and we have to do things in the most ethical, caring way as possible. And, and this is not a question. Mr. Ware, I just want you to give um, a piece of advice for the community, what your great grandfathers and grandfathers would think of you being here along with all of us together. What would they want us to take away? Well, I think both of my grandfathers would be really proud after everything that happened to our family and the things we went through that I would initially step up to the plate and try to make a difference and try to get peoples to understand and be educated and get the vaccine. I think that that would probably be one of my uh, blessings because my grandfather, when I went in Venice there, I tell the story all the time, I needed $1,000 to buy the gas to finish opening up my service station. I, I hear it all the time. I was one of the first blacks that ever had a service station there in Atlanta in 1972 on a major highway. 
He sent me $1,000, and I didn't know Granddaddy was sitting on $1,000. <laughs> but he sent me $1,000 to open my shop up, and I think I said it at last. And now maybe this is one way that I can uh, pay my Granddaddy back and pay him inches if I get this out and let the people know what he suffered and what my family went through. Uh, to kind of educate the people, so don't be afraid because we've been through a lot of things and we come out of it, okay? If you think back, you will think that the things that we come through, we wasn't supposed to come out of them, but we had a way of coming out of them. And it wasn't what the government done, it wasn't what the, it was what the good law brought you through. And that's what I think this brought all of us where we are, and he's going to continue to be our shepherd, and he's going to bring us out of this virus here too, and God knows I might be gone, but it's going to be some other things that we're going to have to go through. But remember how you come out of this one and compare it to the next one, and then it'll help you to overcome some of your burdens and some of the things you go through with. Great. And one other thing I can say, and I, I'm so proud that I didn't know it, and I know what I was doing was from my heart, and what I'd done for your production was from my heart because I didn't read all the print. And when I got a letter, uh, my friend here, Beverly, we got a letter saying we need to fill out this farm here, and it looked like we were going to get conversation for what we done. I done it thinking I was doing a favor and wasn't looking for nothing. My two daughters the same way, she was the same way. And then I felt, well, maybe the Lord put it on my heart not to see this and see if I would just go ahead and do it anyway. And what I done come from my heart. It couldn't come from what I was looking for, fortune and fame, or even being on this stage tonight. It was definitely from my heart and God put everything that I've done for this foundation and everything I said, God put it in my heart. And he, I laid in the bed and I thought about it. He put it on my heart and that's why I feel comfortable Thank being you. here. And I done it through the grace of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of these descendants, um, your contributions in story, your contributions in present, in presence, and everything that you've done to be able to create the legacy campaign. We are appreciative of it, and we thank you. Um, and I enjoyed my time with you moderating this incredible panel. Um, stay tuned for Kelly. She'll be right out to take us into the next panel. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I, before you depart, I just want to say what an honor it has been to meet all of you and to work with you. And we have a DC legend, a royalty here. Her name is Candace Taylor, and she is an incredible artist, a uh, visual artist. And I called her a couple of weeks ago. We did some work with the Crown Coalition, and we unveiled a mural in Anacostia, which is a historic part of Washington, DC. And during that event, I asked her if she would do something special for you. So please meet Candace Taylor, and she's going to do a special presentation to the descendants. Um, yes, hello. Um, so I just want to say really quickly, uh, thank you, Kelly, first, for asking me to uh, create this piece. Uh, it's been my honor to sort of um, allow myself to tap into this story. Um, I have to admit I was very unaware prior to um, Kelly being called. I thought it was an experiment. I thought they were injected. Like, I just had a lot of misinformation, and I just never learned. And so I appreciate, uh, you know, this opportunity to do this research and to, you know, get to the truth. And so um, I was able to, yeah, just look at, you know, the pictures, the images, and sort of do my reading and sort of come to these, um, really these stories about these men who lived these full lives and they built whole families. These were fathers, brothers, um, husbands, they were farmers, tradesmen, craftsmen, so they were more than just participants in a study. And so I wanted to create something that honored the fullness of that. I wanted it to be bright, vibrant. Um, I wanted it to show life, um, sort of the landscapes that these men helped to shape and to really just, um, you know, remind us that these legacies have lived on and these legacies still do live on and you know the number of families, the number of people who have come from their journeys, and you know it's just amazing. And so I didn't want to focus on the tragedy of it. I did want to focus on the triumph. Well, that's and exactly so, what we're doing. Yeah. So, so Karen is going to present this to you, Miss um, Lily, and 
everybody can see it, and each of the descendants will receive one. This is custom, original artwork called The Legacy. And so each of the descendants will receive one of these, and each of you in the audience today will get a special gift, courtesy of Candace Taylor on the way out as well. So thank you so much, Candace. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we'll may may I say something? Yes, absolutely, ma'am. Um, a couple of uh, days after my father found out that uh, he was in the study, I asked him, how did he feel about it? And he, being the man that he was, a man of faith and a man of wisdom and a realist, he said, I can't do anything about what has happened to me and all of those other men, and, but it's up to you all to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. And I'd like to say that this young lady is helping us to do that. Yeah. And all of you are helping us to do that, making sure that a study like this will never happen again to anyone, anyone. Thank you so much, sweetheart. Yes, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Candace. We can leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for that incredible panel. We'd like all of the descendants can come this way, with the exception of Carmen and Dr. Carr. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. So next, our, our second and last panel of the day is really the focus of uh, COVID-19 vaccines and where do we go from here? So we have the Delta variant, we have numbers going the wrong way, we have all kinds of concerns. And so we have a medical panel here to talk about the pandemic and the vaccines. And so first and foremost, we have Dr. Reed Tuxen, the co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID. He will be our moderator today. Please, Dr. Reed Tuxen, our first guest and partner. Dr. Cameron Webb, who is the White House Senior Policy Advisor for COVID-19 Equity. You have met Carmen Thornton Head and Dr. Kimberly Carr. They will stay on this panel. And then we have Jasmine Thompson, who is a senior here at the Howard Met University College of Medicine, and Micah Brown, also a senior at the Howard University College of Medicine. So please welcome our panel. And we'll go right through this. Um, I really want to acknowledge uh, Sherry and Kelly. Uh, they are extraordinary. Please give those two a round of applause. They are wonderful. And I am pleased that, uh, as you heard announced, Dr. Uh, uh, Cameron Webb. Uh, Dr. Webb from the White House has been, uh, when the history of this fight is written, uh, he, along with his colleague, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, will be definitely highlighted uh, in bold type and yellow magic markers all over it. They have been tireless fighters for black survival through this campaign. Please give Dr. Cameron Webb an applause. And finally, I just want to acknowledge so many members of the Black Coalition Against COVID Steering Committee are in the audience as well. Let me turn to Jasmine. Jasmine, um, you are a fourth year medical student. And I know that you have a question to ask of the family. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So my question to you is, as future healthcare professionals, you mentioned earlier that there's lessons that you have to take throughout um, your career and what you do. What are some lessons that Mike and myself and other professionals or future healthcare professionals can take when speaking with our patients and interacting with them and how do we regain the trust in the healthcare system? I would say um, it first starts with, with uh, where you are now um, in your um, understanding of the community that you're working with. Um, you know, um, marginalized communities, um, you know, I think by and large, um, chronic disease, infectious disease, cancer, um, you really impact those communities. And you as practitioners or practitioners-to-be um, will be doing uh, work, a lot of work with, with uh, you know, marginalized communities. And it seems like, you know, as our country grows, those margins are getting, you know, more narrow. And um, 
really working and taking time to understand the community that you're treating is really very important. And I'd also say, I currently work at a National Physicians Association in Washington, D.C., and I head up our research grants and workforce department administering a host of awards portfolio um, for medical students and for early career investigators who are interested in going into the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, I would say that we need so many more um, people of color in working in, in medicine, um, and not just on the practice side, but also on the research side. Um, there's still so much more research that needs to happen um, that's not currently happening. There's gaps in the literature. Um, we really need that. We need you. We need you so much. Um, and so I hope that answers your question. But to understand your community, to don't think anything is beneath you as a physician, um, to, you know, to appreciate a transdisciplinary uh, team, um, because lots of different groups bring a lot of different perspectives and, um, and specialized skills. Um, so to appreciate that and to be humble. And I would say uh, storytelling. I know there are several um, interventions. One would be narrative care um, ethics or narrative care interventions, listening to your patients. So with me uh, in my... Um, current life, I am the Community Resource Specialist at the Georgia Rural Health Innovation Center and is situated at Mercer University School of Medicine. So we interact with our students, well, with their students, um, our, well, their medical students um, just got finished with observership in maternal, um, maternal health, so they were looking at maternal mortality. But I would say um, storytelling and, you know, listening to your patients and understanding their paradigms. So they may not 100% tell you exactly what's going on, and I know that there are different times and you have to be with your patients, but allow them to empower you to listen um, to their narrative so you can help with their diagnosis and all of that. But storytelling, and that's you know a lot of the reasons why we're here today. Descendants, descendant family members telling the stories, and that goes into um, the doctors listening to those stories as well. Beautiful, Micah? Um, I just wanted to start off by saying watching that documentary broke my heart for obvious reasons, but at the same time it inspired me because it showed how strong us as black people are and how when we really get behind something that we care about, we're capable of moving mountains, right? Um, so thank you so much for being here again and you know, for us being a part of this, this is amazing. Um, so as a future physician, um, how can I honor the legacy of your um, family members not in such a negative light, but in a positive light to the patients to be able to you know, exhibit that strength that I, we saw in the video. I would say personhood, that again, your patients are persons, they're people with lives and stories, and to value them and their values, and to, to be empathetic in that way. So um, very quickly that, to truly understand the values of that person, the patient. Beautiful. I would say that recognize that people come from all different walks and you may not necessarily, you, you might see them, you come into the room and you're, you know, doing your research or, or you're um, at your hospital doing your care. Um, you just see what's before you and what's inside going on in their mind, their, their, their experience, you know, how their built environment has impacted them. People are so complex. Um, and to just keep that in mind, to, to keep that in mind. And I would say, um, as you work, um, one day you're going to become a mentor. And there's going to be people that are going to be looking to you who, where, where you are now. Um, and I would encourage you to tell them about the study. Um, We've been doing a host of different things, um, community programs, interviews with different medical schools across the country. Um, and I have to say that I'm really kind of surprised that, you know, there are fourth year medical students who haven't learned anything about the syphilis study. That should not be happening. That should not be happening. And so I'm not sure where you'll land in your career or what you'll specialize in, but I hope that you never forget about the syphilis study and to, to learn also about all of the different ways that it has impacted 
care. I mean, we talked about the institutional review board, we talked about informed consent. Those are major, major things all around the world. And, and um, so I just ask you, just don't forget. Don't forget about us. Outstanding. What a great opportunity that they had to listen to those comments from both of you, and thank you so much. Let me switch really quickly to Dr. Webb and uh, a few rifle shot questions, but very first and foremost, Dr. Webb, anybody that reads the newspaper today has noticed the news seems concerning. Where do you see this pandemic now and where are we headed and what are you worried about? Well, I'm, I'm pretty worried and I think there are a few reasons for that. You know, I work clinically as an internal medicine doctor, so I work on the coronavirus unit at my hospital at the University of Virginia. I'll be working this weekend, actually. And, you know, what we are hearing, what we're seeing really all over the country is that this Delta variant, um, for lack of a better, fra better phrase, is, is no joke. I mean, this Delta variant, there are a lot of things about it that are incredibly concerning features. You know, at the end of May, it was 2.7% of the cases of COVID that we had here. And as of last week, it's 83% of those cases. You know, the early studies are telling us that it's about 1,000-fold increase in the amount of virus that's in people, so that increases the infectivity. And so that's the reason why it's spreading so fast into so many communities. And you've heard the president describe it now that we have this pandemic of the unvaccinated, but you just think about how vulnerable somebody is if they have no immunologic protection whatsoever against something that is spreading as fast and as far as this Delta variant is. It showed us what it can do in India, in the UK, and now right here in the United States. And so, again, I take it very seriously because I've been on the front lines of this pandemic for about 18 months. And, and what I know is that uh, when we see these spikes, people die. And I don't want those people to die. And, and disproportionately, they look like me. Tell us about the uh, Delta variant now and just how prevalent is it and how much more serious is it than the original version of this virus? Yeah, and as, as I mentioned, so we know it's more, it's more serious because it spreads faster, and we know that because we've seen in studies that it's more infective. We've seen that there is more virus present in people the first time they're tested than in the original strains. But even beyond that, we've seen studies that show that it leads to more hospitalizations. We had a 58% increase in hospitalizations here in the United States over the past week. Right? And so we're seeing all of the evidence that this variant is causing the kind of damage that we predicted that it would. And so we've looked at vaccination rates, and I want to be very clear, you know, vaccination is not an academic exercise for us here. It is truly our protection against these things. The data show us that, you know, the, the messenger RNA uh, vaccines are about 90 percent effective, just under 90 percent effective against this Delta variant. And so it is our way to, to protect ourselves in the midst of all this. But in the absence of protection, if you look at Missouri and Arkansas and Mississippi, if you look in Nevada or Utah and Florida, these aren't, you know, the urban centers like New York City where we saw the virus spread so quickly last spring. A lot of times these are more rural spaces, more spread out spaces. The virus can do damage anywhere. And that's what I think is so important for people to understand. The best way to protect yourself certainly is following those public health measures, you know, mask wearing like you all are doing. And, hand washing, maintaining physical distance, avoiding crowded spaces, but vaccination is the best way. And last question for you, Dr. Webb, because we know you've got to be in a meeting at the White House like in two minutes. Um, uh, but we've got to ask you this one more. A lot of people are concerned, uh, those that may be vaccine hesitant because they're worried about the dangers of the vaccine. Are they safe? What do you say to those people who are concerned? Well, you know, I, I always start with uh, whenever we frame things as vaccine hesitancy, I take a step back and I say, what does that actually mean? And, and what that means is a couple of things. It can be complacency. You're hesitant because you feel like I've navigated this pandemic for a year and a half and I'm doing all right. This virus won't do too much damage to me because I'm young and healthy. That's complacency. There's confidence. Vaccine confidence is trusting the safety and the efficacy. All right? And there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of disinformation out there that will confuse, conflate, and confound for people who are trying to figure out, is this something that works for me? And then finally, there's vaccine convenience. Can I reach a vaccine? Is it available to me? Uh, do I have paid time off from work or childcare or transportation or a convenient location that I trust and that I'm familiar with? And all of those things go into vaccine hesitancy. What I always say is when people ask me, what do you do for a family member, a friend, a relative, a coworker who hasn't been vaccinated yet? First thing you do is you ask them, hey, why haven't you been vaccinated yet? You use that listening posture. 
because the survey data tells us that three out of five black Americans have been vaccinated already, but it also tells us that we still have about one out of five black individuals in this country who are considering being vaccinated. And you just have to figure out what'll move them. One out of 20 black people say they wanna get vaccinated as soon as possible. They just haven't done so yet. So you may be able to help them navigate some barrier to vaccination. They want to get vaccinated, just have to get there. And then there's about 15% who are in that wait and see category. And now's the time when you tell them, did you know that 10 million black people have already been vaccinated? Did you know 64 million white people have been vaccinated? Over 17 million Latino individuals. And so when you add it all together, those are the people who are protected so far. Did you know that we've lost 57,000 black lives due to this pandemic? Did you know that 2 million black people have been infected with COVID and more to come if we don't get vaccinated? This is part of our path, part of our plan to navigate this pandemic. So you just have that conversation with them. You give them the space to sit with it and you direct them to good resources. And that's my approach. Thank you, my brother. Please go to your meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you can slip out that way. We owe him a great deal and thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be with us. To our medical students, um, you are of uh, a younger generation than many of us who have been on the stage. Um, we know that young African-Americans and young people in general, but African-Americans are struggling with making this decision in too many cases. What are you seeing and what are you saying uh, to, uh, to young people uh, now that you are about to uh, be full-fledged health professionals who are now fully in the game? So a majority of my friends and obviously all of my classmates has got, have gotten vaccinated, which is a blessing. Um, so I really haven't had to do much, uh, you know, with um, convincing them. But as far as the, my friends and even some family members that have been hesitant, um, I kind of just start off with the facts, like Dr. Webb said, but then make sure to show them that I'm coming from a place of love and care. And like, I want to see you live a full, fulfilled life. And this is what I'm seeing in the hospitals every day. Because, you know, COVID didn't stop our medical education. <laughs> so we've been in the hospital since the very beginning, really being hands on with these patients, really, um, you know, seeing how devastating it can be to not only the patient's life, but the family members not being able to see them and things like that. So I think, think for me, it's just been more of a, you know, stating the facts, but then also sharing with them how I want to see you live a full life and I want you to, you know, get this vaccine and be as safe as possible. Did, I, I, before we go to you, you actually had a comment. That I, did, I did just have a quick comment. Um, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Webb's um, data. I'm sorry he had to leave so soon, but I uh, have Google alerts. And any time, for actually for years now, any time there is a mention of the syphilis study in the news, it comes in my inbox and I can read it. And uh, yesterday, uh, my mom was at my house and I was reading and there was an article about a family, a husband and a wife in Georgia who I guess had some interview at some point and said that they were not, an African-American couple, said they were not going to get the vaccine because of the syphilis study. And that couple is dead. Um, they contracted uh, COVID and they passed away. And so um, it brought tears to my eyes. Um, and so I, I am so excited and um, just overwhelmed and, what, and very happy that so many people are getting the vaccine that are of color. However, there is still a segment that still connect this vaccine with the syphilis study. And if there's anybody who's listening who has those hesitations, if you are using the syphilis study as a reason for not getting the vaccine, stop. Beautiful, beautiful. And for the last comment of our panel, what would, uh, what would be your observation? Um, well, what I've seen is similar to what everyone else has said. What we've done um, at Howard University College of Medicine is partner with some other HBCU medical schools. And we had a social media campaign back in May and the hashtag that we used was HBCUs against COVID. And the um, page or the, like, the theme of it was HBCU CARD, which was a acronym for COVID Awareness and Resilience Day. So what we did for the few days leading up to the day was put out some social media ads and some different pictures and facts basically about why you should get vaccinated, what it's doing to our community, and things that'll lead or hopefully lead people of our age group to finally go and get vaccinated. So that's what we've been doing at Howard. And me personally, I do, as Micah said, talk to people, ask questions, and as Dr. Webb said, ask them why they're hesitant on going, because there are a lot of reasons why I understand people would be hesitant, but there are a lot more reasons to get the vaccine. 
I think you can uh, say comfortably that uh, the future of medical professionals is in good hands. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Let me close out um, by just acknowledging one more time uh, Mrs. Lily Tyson Head. Um, she really is the, the, the inspiration for so much of this. Her personal magnetism, the gravitas of her personality, but also her sense of humanity is what certainly animated me in all of this work. And she has changed me in very important ways. So I really just want to, to just express so much love. And finally, I did get a chance uh, years and years ago to meet some of the, the people that were in the study who were still alive. I was uh, honored to uh, be asked to give a talk uh, at the Tuskegee Syphilis Study um, uh, Memorial. Um, and I will never forget, and I wish that all America could have seen, uh, they handed the microphone to their spokesperson. Uh, this man, uh, diseased and, and, and in some ways broken, but still possessed of the most consummate dignity I have ever seen in my life, stood in front of an entire auditorium, and he had only two words, we forgive. If only we could reach that level of humanity as we fight to save black life. Thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you so much. Really powerful conversation. I love the We Forgive line. Um, we are up for a treat in a few minutes. Uh, another DC royal, member of royalty. But before that, I'd like to introduce to you the par my partner in Joy, Orlena Nwoka Blanchard. We could not do Joy without Orlena. She's an incredible visionary, strategist, um, and just all around wonderful human being and a very dear friend as well. So please welcome Orlena Nwoka Blanchard and then coming up a very special guest. Thank you so much, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just want to say thank you again for this experience, for sharing this time and this space, and to the descendants who I had the pleasure and honor of meeting yesterday evening. Thank you for sharing your truth and your heart with us. Appreciate that. One thing that we've heard all this time together today is the word story or storytelling. And this has been about telling stories of history, telling stories of legacy, telling stories of resilience and triumph, telling stories of dignity, and telling stories of the beauty in us as a people. And while you can see in Deborah's talent as a filmmaker, that's one way we share stories and tell stories but we also do it through song. And I have the privilege today of introducing someone who I became a big fan of years ago when I was introduced to the brilliance of his storytelling through song and musicianship. And he said, when he said, actually, every word in this song is all about you, I was sold. I was like, yes, I'm a fan. And then he said, don't you stress me, sometimes you test me. And my husband became a fan of his storytelling. And he is here today to perform a hit song that actually sparked something is really timely, something you, Miss Lily, said in the documentary that we watched. And you said you had to mention your mother because the stories we've been telling are not just about the men who were part of this study. They are about the families and the community that is part of this study and the history and the legacy. So without further ado, I would like to bring to the stage someone who I consider not just a local talent here from the nation's capital, but a local gift who is here to perform his hit song, Woman. Ladies and gentlemen, Raheem Devon.
Yes, yes, y'all. Peace and love. The legacy of tragedy to triumph would not be possible without our beautiful women that we take our rites of passage through to get here. Can we make some noise for all the beautiful women today? For our matriarchs, our elders, our strong, 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 strong women. You know the vibe, street smart and educated. Can hook up a home-cooked meal sometimes. A God-fearing type of woman, a praying woman. If you know what I'm talking about out there, let me say yeah. Oh, you can say it a little louder, say yeah. So right now, it's time for the Women's National Anthem. I said right now, it's time for the Women's National Anthem. Hey, hey, hey. Dedicated to you, you, and you, and you. This is dedicated to you, you, and you, and you. This is dedicated to you. My mama, your mama, all the ladies say, I, say, oh, oh. I appreciate the style. And the number to take the carrying birth of child. And the way it played on, even when we live in real fast. Even as a single parent mama, you still roll me down somehow. You made the miss me somehow. Ooh, I appreciate the strength that you. How you never but to live and say what's on your mind. Thank you. How you a lady in the street and a lady when it's bedroom time. Thank you. How you gon' cry with me, roll with me. Tell me what's yours is mine. Hey, 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 if you ain't got one, man, it's earth, the world to find a woman. Strong, strong, woman, strong, woman, strong, woman, strong, woman, strong woman, 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 a special woman, woman, woman hey, a beautiful woman, 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 woman yeah, strong woman, woman, woman hey, strong woman, 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 a special woman. woman, 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 woman I appreciate your glow. You can anger at us in the way that you let us know. Oh, thank you. And I think it's so cute when you get so emotional. No, thank you. You know, to you pull your pull, you just can't let it go. But I like that though. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Yeah, like the I love you feeling, girl, when we touch. Like there's no you don't. And if there ever is a need to come in a rush, yes, she will to the rescue. Man, you better find you a woman. woman hey, woman, strong woman. woman, woman I gotta woman, make the love for a woman. woman hey, woman, woman, special woman. woman She got a good head on her shoulder, sexy swagger with sex appeal. A grown woman hook up a home meal. A grown woman exudes confidence. Better recognize one when a grown one says. A grown woman knows how to tell you no. A grown woman knows when to let you go. You can have a big old car and a big old house, but next to God, nothing else amounts to a woman. A strong woman, 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 hey. woman, 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 woman,
are appreciated. Once again, dedicated to all the mothers, you are appreciated. The grandmothers, your sisters, your aunties, all the elders, you are appreciated. Ain't nothing like a strong woman. Uh, you are appreciated. Uh, all the men right now, just say it with me as loud as you can. You are appreciated. Yeah, we're going to say it on the one right here. You are appreciated. Yeah, and clap your hands while you say it now. Hey, you are appreciated. Hey, I keep that going now. All right here, say, you are appreciated. Hey, I keep it going, keep it going while I break it down. Hey, say it louder, say it prouder. Oh, oh, oh yeah. One more time. Hey, oh. Now I want all the ladies to say thank you. We say, hey, you are appreciated. You say, thank you. Keep that going now. Hey, you are appreciated. What? Oh, keep it going. You are appreciated. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You are appreciated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are appreciated, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I am the love king of R&B, keeping it ever so soulful. I go by the name of Raheem Devon. Thank you so much for having me today. Peace and love. I'm going to close us out right now. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our descendants and all of your families for being here with us. Thank you for our guests. And I wanted to just acknowledge, again, our uh, Ad Council friends. Sherry Thompson, if you can please join us. Join me. Arlena Nwoka Blanchard, President and COO of Joy Collective. Uh, Dr. Reed Tuxen from the Black Coalition Against COVID and all of our friends who worked so hard on this, including many people at the Joy Collective and Ad Council and BCAC. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Raheem Devon, that was incredible. Thank you, just awesome, thank you for that. Uh, thank you to Candace Taylor and this for this beautiful, beautiful picture, custom artwork, appreciate you. Uh, we encourage all of you to get all of the videos and get all of the facts at getvaccineanswers.org slash legacy. You can see all the documentary there. You can see all of the films um, and also get great information. And also please share this information with others so we can really encourage us, our community, who may be skeptical, may be hesitant to get vaccinated. We really would appreciate you sharing. Tomorrow, this event will be uh, on the NAACP's YouTube page, so you can see it there. We'll be, it'll be a cut down, but that will be available there. And then one last big thank you to Deborah Riley Draper, our director. <laughs> if you could please join us up here as well, I would appreciate you. And I just want to say how incredibly um, honored we are to have had an opportunity to work with you and just really appreciate you bringing these stories to life in such a beautifully human way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And did you want to say something? I'm not a doctor, so this is not related to health, but what this is related to is the health of our community. What we have are black women storytellers. We have a partnership here that is very strong and one you don't often see in advertising and marketing. You have an advertising marketing lead in Sherry leadership. You have entrepreneurship in Orlena and Kelly, the owners of an African-American advertising agency. And I'm the owner of a African-American production company. So this is a rare Madison Avenue moment right here. And it's one that we should recognize and one that we should try to see more often. So thank you ladies for letting me be a part of this. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our program. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Enjoy your afternoon. Stay safe. Thank you again to Howard University and for all of our guests. Really appreciate you.